Thank you very much, uh, Jago. So I'm going to moderate the first session that focuses on single cell sequencing techniques in the lab. And for this first session, we will have three speakers, Trevor Nolan from Duke University, Jago Pafalvi from the Max Planck Institutes for Plant Breeding Research in Germany, and Dong Bo Chi from the University of Potsdam in Germany as well. And so I'm going to uh, have first Trevor um, speaking. Uh, Trevor get his master and his PhD degree from Iowa State University. His PhD, uh, he received his PhD in 2018. And then he's currently a postdoctoral research associate at Duke University in the laboratory of Philip Benfi. And he recently published a beautiful paper last month in science on Arabidopsis taliana roots and uh, the Brassner steroid uh, pathway. And so I suspect we are going to have uh, some information on, on this too. So Trevor. Great, thanks for the introduction, Mark. And thanks for having me on the panel here. I will share my screen. Let's see. Can you see that okay? Perfect. All right, great. It's it's wonderful to to be here on this workshop and and talk about one of my favorite things in the lab, which is single cell sequencing experiments. Uh, so my goal today is to to hopefully get you excited about doing single cell, tell you a little bit about why you might want to do it, and then if if you've decided to do this and you're sort of taking a first delve into this, um, I want to talk to you about how you can produce high quality data, how you can design your experiments uh, soundly. And then once you've profiled your cells, how, how you might quality control your library and, and think about addressing the, the sequencing. And although there's many technologies to do single cell these days, my talk's gonna focus today primarily on droplet-based technologies, uh, such as those commercially available from 10X Genomics. And this is a nice illustration produced by Ty Dow that shows essentially in droplet-based single cell sequencing, we're putting a cell and a barcode together along with chemical reagents. And this allows us to access the transcriptome of those individual cells and produce a cell by gene matrix that we can then use for downstream analysis. For example, to reconstruct cell lineages from, from single cell RNA sequencing data. And this exam enables us to do things like to dive into developmental trajectories, to profile mutants, or to look at context specific responses to stimuli such as environmental stresses or pathogens. And I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about our own research today, but I just wanna give you a little bit of flavor of, of what we do in the lab. Uh, so I'm gonna give you two examples. The first of which is an effort led by Rachel Shahan in our lab in Chao Wei Shu, uh, where we've produced a large single cell atlas of the Arabidopsis root spanning more than 110,000 cells. And this allowed us to, to capture both the, the complement of cell types present in the root, as well as their developmental progression from meristem to elongation and maturation zone. And I just am gonna focus in on one, one aspect of this, and that's that we can reveal continuous developmental trajectories by looking at this high resolution data. So for example, the endodermis and cortex are two cell types that share a common stem cell, and we can actually re-extract them from this data. We can look at their developmental progression from meristem elongation to maturation. And we can also look at a, a more fine-grained uh, pseudo time where we see these nice waves of gene expression, including known regulated regulations such as Scarecrow, MIB36, and Cas1 that, that come on in this developmental progression. And we can also identify new things. Uh, for example, this marker CDF2 is a, is a elongating cortex marker that's become important for, for my own work. And now that we have this atlas, rather than doing the experiment kind of over again fresh, we can actually use it as a, a resource to annotate new data sets and to inform which cell types and developmental stages are there so that we can look at mutants or we can look at stimuli uh, such as bioperforming time courses. And I'm interested in Brassina steroids, which are a group of plant steroid hormones that modulate many processes, uh, including root growth and development. But it's been hard to disentangle uh, how these hormones function in particular cell types at certain developmental stages. And in order to address this, we've used the root as a model system where we've sequenced more than 200,000 individual cells from a Brassinocera time series, as well as from related mutants. And this allowed us to, to identify an unexpected cell type, the cortex, in a particular developmental stage, which is the elongation zone, uh, where a, a number of transcription factors, including HAT7 and GTL1, are playing an important role in regulating cell wall-related genes to actually promote cell expansion and, and influence root growth. 
Um, so I, I hope that applications like these will, will be exciting for you, you know, to do single cell experiments in your own lab. And of course you can do this not only in the Arabidopsis root, but across different organs and tissues and, and many plant species of which we're seeing a lot of beautiful examples of these days. So as you're thinking about setting up single cell in your lab, um, there's a number of important things to consider. In my mind, first and foremost is to establish protocols to produce high quality data, as this is really going to be the foundation to, uh, to solid analysis. And next is to design and perform an experiment that will address your biological question, and then to prepare and sequence the, the library. And of course, this bench side is really just the first half of the equation. The, the real the fun starts uh, when you start analyzing the data and generating new hypotheses and, and following up on them in the lab. And as Google mentioned, this will be covered in, in part two of, of this workshop. In terms of producing high quality single cell data, one of the first things you might want to ask yourself is which biological entity uh, would I bet most benefit from profiling? Uh, for example, in plants, we can digest away the cell walls and produce protoplast. And this allows us to access a high number of transcripts in the whole cells. And these are easy to isolate from some species and organs. Uh, for example, from roots, we can really easily do this with a large number of samples. However, it, the protoplast can be difficult to isolate from other species or more difficult organs. There are potential effects on gene expression, such as stress-related genes. And we can see cell size or, or tissue biases. Another alternative <clears throat> is to profile nuclei. And here we have a, a relatively lower number of genes or transcript detected per nucleus and a lack of the whole cell information. Uh, but we do see a broader applicability across species and tissue. Um, and we have a lower likelihood of affecting gene expression during the preparation process because it's relatively short and, and can be done on ice. And also we see less cell size or, or tissue bias from these kind of preparations. And in either case, it's really important that you're producing high quality cells or nuclei that have high RNA content inside and that are not spewing RNA into the solution that's going to cause high background in, in your assays. Uh, so how can you look at this to, to start to convince yourself uh, what your protoplasts or nuclei are looking like? Uh, so one way we do this in the lab is just to visually assess the, the cells. So for example, on the left-hand side, you can see nice round cells here with minimal debris. However, on the, the right-hand side, we see you know, a number of cell of burst cell, cell clumps uh, that are less happy. And they, this, this can really introduce problems into the downstream analysis. And you can do this not only just visually, but you can also use a number of dyes. For example, FDA it stains live cells, as you can see here. And others, other dyes like PI can be used to stain dying or dead cells where, where they will penetrate. And you can use this to calculate a percentage viability of your cells. And I think a, a, a typical viability number that people throw around is, for example, greater than 80% viability is, is a good starting point. Uh, similarly, uh, nuclei quality is also very important for single nucleus RNA sequencing experiments. And here's an example from 10X Genomics. You can see a, a nice nucleus with an intact nuclear membrane. And, and I suspect we'll, we'll hear more about this from, from Sandra later on during the, the multi ohm session. To give you an idea of the consequences of this, I'm just going to show you this barcode rank plot here, which is a, a diagnostic plot from analysis where we're plotting the number of unique transcripts or UMIs versus the number of barcodes. And I want to show you, even in our lab where we've been protoplasting for decades, our initial attempts had relatively few high quality cells. A lot of these red, uh, red barcodes with a high percentage of mitochondria that are indicative of dead or dying cells. And this means that you're having noisy data. You're also having few retained high quality cells for your analysis. However, as you continue to practice and to improve your protocols, you can then see a much clearer separation of the high quality cells from the background. And this will lead you to be able to detect more uh, genes uh, per cell and overall, and to retain a higher quality or higher number of cells for, for your downstream analysis. Uh, so yes, as I mentioned, I think the, this is really the first step is to generate high quality data. And then once you've done this, to begin to think about designing your single cell RNA sequencing experiment to address your, your biological question of, of interest. Uh, one of the first things you might ask yourself to this end is, what cells am I interested in profiling? How abundant is this cell population? in the tissue that I'm working with. 
And if you're fortunate enough to, to work in systems where you have fluorescently labeled marker lines and you're looking at a rare cell type, you might consider doing things like fax enrichment uh, that has proven very fruitful. I mean, several studies for, for profiling things like Arabidopsis roots. And alternatively, if you don't have markers, you can also consider dissecting various parts of an interest uh, to, to more to target uh, cells that you might be wanting to look at. Uh, you also need to, to convince yourself how many cells and replicates you need to per perform for a, a given experiment. And I think that this is a good time to, uh, to mention that even though single cell is relatively new, it's, it's still pretty expensive, although it's, it's getting more reasonable, that the best practices for experimental design still apply. So I'll just list a non-comprehensive non uh, list here. I think one thing that's really important is always to have your control and treatments or mutants, things that you want to compare done in a side-by-side -side manner. Uh, just like you, you wouldn't measure the root length of wild type in one lab and a mutant in a different lab, uh, we shouldn't do this for, for single cell. We also want to do our best to avoid batch effects and confounding. So I can give an example if it takes more than one person to do the experiment and we're profiling wild type and mutant, rather than me profile wild type and, and you handle the samples from mutant, we can each ha handle a, a different replicate um, in order to account for potential person-to-person uh, -person variation. Um, it's also important to select conditions and time points that are relative to you or relevant to your biological question. And we found particularly helpful to, to look at reporters or to do bulk RNA-seq or quant-seq uh, to really hone in on, on the time point or the, uh, the mutants that, that are important for your experiments. Um, it's, a, it's also essential to uh, record your metadata, your detailed experimental uh, procedures and the, the version of reagents you're using, and to include as many independent biological replicates set as is feasible in terms of both cost and, and person time. I want to say a few more words about this. So uh, when I first started doing single cell experiments, we were trying to figure out replication and people would say, uh, well, you have 10,000 cells, you actually don't need to do replicates, you have 10,000 replicates. Uh, but actually 10,000 cells is, is not 10,000 replicates if they come from the same sample. And a nice example of this was on Twitter just a couple of weeks ago from Nathan Skeen. And this is a reanalysis of an Alzheimer's single nuclei data set that was published in Nature a couple of years ago, where they found thousands of differentially expressed genes at these really extreme p-values. And as Nathan points out, a caveat here was that they were treating each cell as an independent replicate, when in fact, these many of the cells were confounded from, from different individuals. Uh, and when you treated them in a more statistically appropriate way, it actually found many fewer D, D genes, so only 16 genes that were changing, which was 892 times fewer um, than the original analysis found. Um, so uh, a detailed look in this is, is probably more appropriate for the analysis side of the workshop, but I want to point to a couple of papers that have been helpful for me in thinking about how to design these kind of experiments. And the essential point is that cells from the same sample share a common environment, that in which they were grown. Also, they share ambient RNA that can leak from the cells. And thus, it's important to, to replicate your data and to ideally to confirm biological hypothesis using multiple orthogonal um, assays whenever possible. Uh, so now that you've thought about designing and performing your experiment, let's talk about after you've run the chromium, for example, and you have cDNA. So I have just a few pointers for preparing the library and doing quality control. So it's important to follow the instructions of the given user guide specific to the version of reagents you're using. For example, with 10X, we might have version three versus 3.1 versus high throughput. We've also found in our lab that it, it really helps with quality to avoid over cycling, over amplifying your library. And you can use uh, bioanalyzer traces, for example, to look uh, to aid in the quality control before sequencing. So for example, here, this is an example cDNA trace. We see the distribution of cDNA. We can look at the average fragment size as well as the concentration. And here's another example showing a final library uh, where we also note in our metadata the, the average fragment size as well as the, the concentration. Once you have your library, you need to think about how to sequence it. So a typical range of sequencing ranges from 20 to 50,000 reads per cell. 
Uh, but this is highly dependent on your sample type, what your goals are, as well as the background RNA levels. And if you're doing a large experiment for the first time, it can be particularly useful to run a small pilot experiment like a MySeq run uh, to, to get an initial estimate of your cell number as well as your, your library quality. And there's a, a useful metric called sequencing saturation uh, that gives you an indication on the return on investment for your additional sequencing. So I'm just gonna show you an example of a library with a, a higher complexity here. So that we're plotting mean reads per cell versus the sequencing saturation. So as we approach one, we're essentially not seeing any new molecules. And you can see that we have a relatively gradual increase here where we're, we're still not saturated at even over 100,000 reads. And we're seeing a, a relatively high number of genes per cell. And on the bottom is an example of a library with lower complexity. And you'll notice that the sequencing starts to become saturated much early and that we get less return on investment with more sequencing per cell when, you, when you're you know, doubling from 20 to 40,000 uh, reads per cell, for example. Uh, so with that, I, I hope uh, I've got you excited about single cell and given you at least a few things to start to think about. Um, so I want to point out that our single cell sequencing data in our code are publicly available. Uh, so you can look at our geo accessions, our, our star protocols for single cell processing. And if you're just thinking about doing single cell and you want to start to look at what this data are like, you can go to our interactive web browser, which is called Arvex, where you can access all of our data and interactively explore it. And you can also check out our, our code and tutorials uh, for the analysis side of things. So with that, I want to thank all the people involved in this project, especially Philip, uh, Rachel, Isaiah, and Choe, our funding. And with that, I will say good luck with your experiments. And please reach out to me if you have questions or comments, uh, anything I can be helpful with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trevor. That was an excellent first talk, first introduction. So thank you very much.